There we go. All right, so. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Ken Rosenthal. I am a park naturalist at Gulf Branch Nature Center. I feel like I know or have met everybody that's on here. Um, what we're going to do today is tonight, essentially, we're going to talk about iNaturalist. We're going to talk about uh, just using it, you know, for fun, but also in um, preparation for the City Nature Challenge, which is coming up this Friday through Monday, <clears throat> April 30th through May 3rd. Uh, and so again, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me uh, and I am going to go ahead and share my screen and get us started. Um, whenever I do these presentations, I always try to pop in something uh, that I've learned uh, from using iNaturalist. Uh, and while this is not the first one uh, that I found, this is a wandering broadhead planarian, which turns out is more than likely an invasive species of uh, flatworm that um, it's way too easy to find right now, uh, unfortunately, in the park. Um, they use something called chitrototoxin, which is the toxin in pufferfish. And if you know anything about eating pufferfish, if you don't have a skilled chef, you don't want to try that because you can get um, fatally sick from them. Uh, but that same toxin is in these flatworms, probably not in doses that can uh, harm or kill us, but you definitely don't want to handle them. And, and again, all that I learned by finding this critter, taking a picture of it and discovering what its name was and then doing a little research on it, which is really neat. Again, it's, it's kind of a bummer that it's not native. Um, I believe it's from um, uh, somewhere in Asia um, in probably one of the rainforests. It's come in on potted plants that are, um, you know, brought in on ornamentals from from other areas uh, just like any other invasive just like some of our stuff ends up in other continents where it becomes invasive as well uh, but anyway this is um something that i discovered because i use iNaturalist and because i took a picture of it and i got uh an identification so um iNaturalist is a whoops that is a really happy cursor button <clears throat> iNaturalist is a community science uh compute ugh, community science um, app and website where they gather observations from the public and then if they can get it to research grade and I'll explain what that means in, in a minute um, it is made available to the global biodiversity information facility which I'll show you uh, in a minute as well and then researchers from around the world can access this and it's essentially a free trove of of information um, you know there's only so many scientists there's only so many researchers they can only get out into the field so many times and so having access to this citing data from people around the world who are just like hey i ran into this and took a picture of it uh, can be really helpful it can and, um it can help with uh, phenology and changing on how some things change as far as when flowers bloom when birds are migrating uh, when trees leafing in, uh, you know, when the leaves fall, all these different kinds of things. So this is this can be a really important um, piece of information. Um, Cornell has already done this with um, eBird uh, and all the information they've collected from years and years and years of, of, of birders uh, recording their their lists and, and sharing them. So it's really neat. So let's say you find this cute, cuddly, adorable little snake um in your yard under a rock in your basement this is where i found this one was in the basement of the nature center and you're not sure what it is one of the things you can use iNaturalist for um is to post it up there and if you don't know what it is you can post it up um without an actual identification or the the final identification um hopefully you would recognize it's a snake and you could start there and just be like well it's a snake uh and then get further on and again i'll explain how you do that in a little bit um and then you can get the community has the opportunity if they come across this to be like oh i know what kind of snake that is and then they can add to it um it is you can see this citing is research grade essentially when two-thirds of people agree on your sighting and its identification, it becomes research grade if it's at the species level. It can also be research grade if it's not at the species level because it can't go any further. Um, many, many things I'll explain later on that become more apparent. Um, so, um, you know, this tiny little snake is research grade. Somebody else agree with me. I, I think several people did. Um, and, and that's really neat. And then in addition to 
just being a part of the data set that goes to the global biodiversity information facility um, there are other projects that people start and it can go into those as well uh, we have several projects uh, in Arlington um, there are some that you know I, I don't know any of the people that started these but every reptile automatically goes into the global reptile bio blitz um, I added it to these two because I'm members and so I, I keep up with adding anything I find in Virginia into the Virginia biodiversity project um, and anything I find in either my house or at the nature center which was an old house I add into this never home alone uh, project uh, and then you know if you go all the way to the bottom there is a checklist of what is in your observation? This is where it gets really fancy, you know. So if somebody's an observer, they want to see all the criteria that it meets. So that's all right there. Oh, it's what I'm doing there. Um, and so that's all right there. And then this says right here, this observation is featured on one site. And again, GBIF for the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. So um, this is GBIF. You can see it's free and open access to biodiversity data. And, and I think this is this is really important is, you know, if, if you're automatically, you know, already going out and you find something neat and you're taking pictures and you, and you share it on there, you know, for Lark and you can get an identification and that's really fun and you get a couple neat pictures and you get a story or memory out of it. But this can be important data, especially if you find something that's really not, either not where it's supposed to be or it's surprising that it's where that that's where it is now. Um, that can be really, really helpful. You can see you know, this at the time that I took the screenshot. I'm sure this is much higher because I'll bet you the screenshot was last year. You know, they've got over 1.4 billion occurrence records. So that is a really large set of data that hopefully is being used. Um, so what is an observation? I keep saying that. What is an observation? <clears throat> um, there's five key pieces that iNaturalist needs for an observation in order for it to become research grade it can only become research grade if someone else can chime in and agree so if you do if you just say i saw this but you don't um supply any evidence which is the bottom right one here uh by the camera icon um then that's it's never going to get to research grade so you need evidence if you want that um if you want it to reach that status and be be more useful um but the the criteria are who you are and the minute you log in you know, you've created an account the minute you log in or the minute that you use your app on your phone, assuming again, you're also logged in on that, that is automatically recorded. Um, then for your observation, you need where you saw the organism, what you saw, um, you know, in this case, obviously it's a butterfly, when you saw it and when you saw it and where you saw it, depending on what you're using to take your picture or record your sound, uh, may already be recorded for you in metadata, which can be really helpful. Uh, and then, like I said, the evidence of what you saw, so it's either a picture or a sound recording. Um, you, it, it doesn't have to be the organism. You know, I see a lot of pictures that are feathers, that are pieces, parts of an animal that was eaten. I see a lot of pictures that are um, scat, you know, uh, tracks, um, other kinds of distinctive mark or damage to plants from grazers or animals that eat the plants or somebody who rubs their antlers on the tree you know so you'll see all kinds of different things in addition to the actual organisms themselves but those five key pieces right here these five pieces of information is what makes an observation an iNaturalist so you see this fuzzy thing on a fence and you think I'd really like to know what that is I think most of us know at least half of that name um, so you you get on to the desktop. I'm going to start with the desktop uh, and the internet, uh, and then I'm going to make some. Uh, I'll share some things about um, using the app and the iPhones. Um, I really feel like the iPhones tend to be that you can easily pick up uh, using the apps on either the iPhone or the Android by going through this because it's all very similar in, in what you do. So on the desktop, I'm going to click upload. And it's going to give me this big screen and you can I've never used more import options. And I don't know what that does. Somebody there might be people that do. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but I use choose files. So I would click on the blue um, and then I would go to the file that has the pictures I want to upload. In this case, I just have one um, on this screen that you're seeing here. Once you hit that choose files and you choose the pictures, you could get you know several rows of pictures depending on how many you do at one time. In this case, I'm just doing one. So I zoomed in on that picture. So here is my evidence now. This is my evidence of the organism I saw, and I'm going to fill in the rest of this. Now you can see it says loading metadata. So when my camera 
it has date and time, so this is going to appear. Location is not because I don't have a GPS um, chip or uh, option for my camera. Some people have that. I do get that with my phone because I always have the um, the GPS on in my phone. If you're not getting that metadata on pictures from either your camera or your phone, more than likely it's the setting of your device and it's not iNaturalist is changing that. So let's uh, let me show you how we're going to enter all of this here. Uh, when you click on that species name box, they have a, a really, really cool, I don't know if it's an algorithm or an AI, um, but they have a really cool um, piece of computer programming that essentially looks at that picture, compares it to the millions of other observations they have, and gives you a best guess. A lot of times you get something like this where you get the genus, but you're going to have to make your own guess on the species but a lot of you know sometimes if it's if it's fairly common that first species is more than like what it is and i'll tell you it's visually similar and it's been seen nearby you know we don't have allen squirrel arizona gray squirrel um fox squirrel has been seen nearby but this is definitely eastern gray squirrel you get that white belly and the gray um so i will scan, scan down and click on that and now I've got Eastern Gray Squirrel. I clicked on this here. You can see how it's highlighted. Um, and it opened up a map of the world and I zoomed in to where I was. Or you can write down the address or the name of the park and it'll get you there quicker. Um, and I zoomed in on that. And so now I have the what, the when, and the where. I already have the who, that's me, which is um, instantaneous when I log in everything you put in from there is all you know it's all under you and then my evidence is the photo so right there is your five pieces of information you need for an observation uh, in iNaturalist all right you can add the projects um, if that's if this isn't something this is something to explore on your own time like I don't want to get too much into it but sometimes people do put up projects um, because they're just curious of what's out there or there are people that are actually doing some research and they want to see what's being found um, a lot of the projects now are what's called collection projects. So it's like something like birds of the world. Every observation that has a bird or a part of a bird or a track of a bird or a bird poop, whatever it is, is going to go in there. It's automatically going to be added. Every observation that is um, taken within the boundaries of Gulf Ranch Nature Center where I work automatically goes into our Gulf Ranch program because I set up a collection uh, project for that. So there's a lot of neat collection projects. There are some that are not like these that for whatever reason you need to be entered uh, manually and you can do that as well here. Um, in this case, the one I'm going to do is this bio Virginia Biodiversity Project because for some reason it doesn't collect every sighting in Virginia and I don't know why they haven't changed that yet. Um, but Virginia Biodiversity Project is the one I will be checking right there. And then once I'm done, all the way to the right, which you can't see now, is the um, submit observations button. In this case, it would say one. If you had done like 30 of these and prepped, they would say submit 30. Um, what I often do is go through my photos. I do all my observations after the fact of taking the picture or the um, images uh, or the recordings. And so yeah, I would pull up a, a folder with all the pictures from, say, uh, Long Branch Nature Center when I was over there the other day and then I would choose all the pictures I'm going to upload and put them in and work on them in this in this um, on this screen and then when we're all done it might say you have uh, you know submit 14 observations so I would submit all the observations at once uh, and that way I can like select all of them if they're all like let's say they're all like around that pond that's right next to the Nature Center I could select them all and just do one location for all of them which makes it a lot easier and a little less tedious with entering everything in. So once I've submitted my observation, there it is. Here's my observations table and there at the top is my new observation. Um, this is what I did uh, a couple years ago, so that date is a little old, but this is how you would go through the process and it hasn't changed much in the in the two years since that was done or the year and a half. Excuse me, um, so let's keep marching along here. Oh, and then if you open up that, observation this is what's going to look like so your evidence would be right here up at the top is um in this case this was taken right after i put it up so nobody had a chance to agree with it yet um so this is what my identification was you can see it needs id because there's only one person saying that that's what it is uh, and then here's a map and this big blue one is where i 
observed the gray squirrel, all these other blues are where other people have observed other gray squirrels. Um, and so it can be really neat because sometimes you get a lot of, of maps like this, like for dandelions and um, other things like that. And sometimes you get a map like this and there's only one or two and you've seen something that not a lot of other people have seen and, and reported. And that's always really cool. Uh, and here's the address or the name and location. When you observed it, when you submitted it, uh, and then there's your name and um, uh, in, information there as well. And then down here is the projects. And in this case, when I put this in, I added it to the Virginia Biodiversity Project. It already went, it automatically went into Biodiversity and Gulf Branch, and that's really cool. Oops, go to it. Uh, the other thing that's neat is now there's another Vi Virginia Wildlife Project, and it automatically takes them in. So uh, that one would pop up as well. And you can scroll down here. There's like top identifiers of Eastern Gray Squirrel, like by number, uh, or you know, number the person who's identified the most Eastern Gray Squirrels. And you will occasionally see, like, when you get updates, and it'll be like somebody went through and identified the same organism on all of yours. And I always feel like those are people that are like trying to stack themselves into being the number one identifier or something. Uh, and there will be the num they'll have the top observers as well. So those are always fun. Um, on your, this is my iPhone. This is where the screens came from. It's not. I think it's very similar to the Android um, and I'll, I'll show you in a second uh, another way to learn about this as well. So but this is my iPhone. I've opened up the um, iNaturalist app. You can get the iNaturalist app from uh, the Google Store, the Apple Store, uh, wherever you get your apps from. It's it's going to be in there. Just search iNaturalist and it'll be there real quick and it's free. So if there's something that says iNaturalist is trying to make you pay, that's not the right app. Um, so I've got my my app open. This is mostly the app is really mostly about making observations. It's very much um, not meant for you to explore and look at your data and look at everybody else's data. You know, it's not the same interface as the computer. Um, so what you're going to do to make an observation um, is you're going to hit the observe button right here. Now, again, as I mentioned, I don't like to miss stuff when I'm out. So I don't do my observations while I'm in the field. I just take a ton of pictures and I come back and I see which ones are good and which ones I want to, you know, um, upload and which ones I want to delete. Uh, and so when I'm doing this I, and I hit observe, you get these options. I'm always doing camera roll because I'm going through my camera roll and, and putting observations in of the pictures I've already taken. Uh, you can see one of the new things they added, and I love this, is the on this right button here, the record sound. And that's fantastic. I have not used it yet. Don't know how well it works. I will tell you that <clears throat> for the iPhone, the speaker is at the bottom. So one of the things that I've done when I use the voice memos app to record sounds, which is what I would have done previously, is I turn my phone around essentially upside down so the bottom is sticking away from me so I can get the best possible uh, recording of whatever sound I'm trying to record. Whether it's a bird call or a frog call, um, you know, or whatever the noise may be. And so, you know, keep in mind wherever the that microphone is that records you know, it takes in your voice and records whatever sounds you make or you use to record, you know, voice memos. Make sure that's facing away from you so you're getting whatever sound you're trying to record. Um, and then, as you can see, there's also camera. So you could do the camera as well. And then no photo. It's just you can make casual observations. Hey, you know, I saw a deer today. I didn't get a photo or a recording sound, but I want to mark that. You certainly can, but there's nothing for other people to look at to confirm to help identify with you and so it tends to not be very um i'm sorry my personal bias is it tends to not be very helpful if it's a way of you for you marking the things that you've seen by all means do that um it just it, it's because it's a casual um observation it's never going to re get research grade so it won't be part of that bigger picture but it certainly a, it helps to make a list for you you know and do what you want to do and get out of iNaturalist. Make sure you're using it for you as well as you know if you're contributing to uh, these community science projects. So this is what it looks like on um, the iPhone. Oh, and then if you do the camera roll, you can submit up to four photos at one time. When you are using the desktop, you can use as many photos as you want. I've seen some that had like 15 or 20 photos. Sometimes very worthwhile, sometimes not so much. You know, if you're going to use more than one photo, try to make sure you're showing something different in each of the photos. Make it make it worth uh, putting it up there. Unless it's really cool and it's like a fight between two animals, then just you know put all the pictures up because somebody's going to enjoy that. Um, one of the ones I saw with like 15 or 20 observations was this really interesting um, type of, I think, uh, an eagle that had 
picked up a cobra and somebody had gotten these really nice snaps of it flying away with this cobra trailing from its foot. And it was just really cool um, images. So there are nice tutorials on the iNaturalist.org on how to make an observation with your iPhone or with your Android. And again, like I said, they're very similar. You know, there's always going to be a few uh, differentials, but you know, they both have eight steps. You know, they both start by tapping the observe button. So uh, it's going to be very similar regardless of how you do it. Um, I want to make a quick mention that the City Nature Challenge starts Friday uh, and it runs through Monday. I will be at work at the at Gulf Branch. Most of, I should be around all day Friday. Definitely be around all day Saturday because I've got a, a couple programs in the morning. One of them is an iNaturalist program to do this in person. So if you want to stop by either day for a little more help or with your phone uh, or some tips or just, you know, have somebody that's nearby so you can do a couple of observations and make sure it's good, please feel free to do that. If you want to email me, let me know ahead of time when you're coming and I can let you know if I'll be around or not. Uh, but I'd love to help because, again, I really enjoy this kind of stuff. This is one of my favorite things to do. Um, the other thing I want to do is I'm going to go through a few tips for taking photos uh, and making sure that you, um, you know, get the best out of it you can. We all hope for that really good photo where it's very obvious what you're seeing. Uh, in this case, this is a 12 spotted skimmer. Um, I was very, very pleased with this picture because I spent 20 to 30 minutes slowly walking towards the dragonfly picture after picture after picture getting bigger and bigger and bigger and this was I think as close as I got because I didn't want to disturb it but we all hope for that kind of picture you know we all hope for um, this picture is going to be but you can take a picture like that and still not get to the species level uh, on the left is a uh, xanthotype x-a-n-t-h-o-t-y-p-e uh, moth uh, this is a kind of moth that if you don't dissect certain important parts of it, uh, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between the species. Um, I've seen a moth guide that says you can by the coloring on the wings, but I, everything I've read that, that uh, that's not very accurate. And so um, sometimes you have to be happy that even though you got a good picture, you're only going to get it to the genus level or maybe even the, the family level, you know, depending on what you've taken a picture of. Um, it's still exciting. You saw something, you got to include an observation. Um, but sometimes, yeah. Now on the right, this is a crow. Everybody's like, yeah, it's a crow. Well, we have two kinds of crows in Northern Virginia. We have American crows, ah, 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 and we have fish crows. Eh, eh. And so if you can get that call, the difference between ah, 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 and eh, eh, that's going to help you. But if you just have a picture like this and, you know, no sound or you don't have a, a note that you can make that says what sound you heard, um, the, the closest you're going to get is the genus, which is Corvus. Uh, because we do have both of those kinds of crows around here. Um, and I have, uh, uh, I think, several observations with crows where I've got the picture, but I've also managed to record the sound so that, I, you know, I can get that research grade and, and give a better quality of observation. So, and I like, and again, this is yeah, similar nice too. Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, so one thing I don't know how to do is add more than one picture and add sound to a picture. Can you walk us through that at some point? Yeah, you know what? At the end, I can share my screen and show okay. you how you would do that. Absolutely. I, I hear do what it. you're saying here, and I, I've read that before, but I don't know how to do it. Okay. Yeah, no, that's no problem. Um, on, on the phone, when you're scrolling through your camera roll, it'll let you select up to four, and each time you touch one, you get its little blue circle with a check mark. I'm assuming it's something similar on Android. Um, when you do it on the desktop, you just stack them on top of each other and i think i have yeah i have something i can show you how to do that oh, i'm seeing that someone there's an, another i want to make sure i'm make, not missing any comp um oops can you all still hear me is everybody able to hear me Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, try to find. I tried to find the chat, and I was afraid I, I knocked myself out here. Okay, so, um, so again, on on the left is a type is a type of moth. On the right is a type of crow. Sometimes you need additional information, and sometimes you you simply won't get that. Like I said, with the, with the moth, I'd rather take a picture of the moth and dissect it. So. I'm going to be happy with genus. If I can't get the sound or make a note about what sound I heard, 
um, I'm going to be stuck with Corvus. And, 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 and again, you know, I want to be okay with this. I want to enjoy it and do it. I don't want to stress out too much on on pitch on this kind of thing. Um, sometimes you get a picture like this and that bird is identifiable. It's just very far off. So you can do a couple of things. Um, I like to edit some of my pictures uh, often. I just stick them in paint and I'll put a big colored circle around them so people can see them. You can also, I think in, in, in and again, paint is Microsoft. There's, I'm sure, photo editing software for on Macs. Uh, the other thing you can do is crop it and enlarge it uh, and you can see it. Um, you know, your resolution gets shot a little bit here, so it's definitely not, you know, a clear uh, bird with a lot of, of tight lines, but you can see you got two orange wing bars, you had a nice thick bill here. It's a dark blue bird. This is a, a blue grosbeak, so you can still get that identification um, that, you know, I, and I think if you did this as well, you could, but whenever you can highlight what you want seen or make it a little bigger, that helps uh, the potential identifiers. There are people who are on iNaturals and they identify a lot of stuff and you can tell they probably spend time you know, sometimes, you know, several minutes to an hour or two every night, just cruising through iNaturals looking for stuff to identify, which I think is great. You know, every now and then uh, I'll do that as well. Um, and so whenever you can make it easier on them because they're helping, hopefully helping you out, find, you know, discover something new, um, that's great. Um, this is a picture I probably should have cropped. Uh, would have certainly been looked colder, but it didn't really need to. It's, you know, everything you need to see is right there. This is a red-tailed hawk, and there's that red tail. And you know, there's a the dark comma on the wing is, is diagnostic too, but um, you know that that tail is going to get you everywhere you're going to go. And sure enough, when I did it, um, pretty quickly I got you know my second identification and went right to research grade. And then once you do that, you know of course you got projects. It went into this was directly above the Nature Center when I took the photo. Uh, Burles of the World, which I mentioned earlier, and then I had added it to Virginia Biodiversity Project. So again, um, you'll see this come up, and it's really neat because again, once you put the the sighting in, um, they 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 fill into the projects almost immediately. So you know you do your your sighting and then go and open it, and you'll see that's already in two three projects or whatever. Uh, and then again here you can see all the the quality of the um, oh oops, sorry I never plugged in my screen got dim there and I don't want to lose power. Um, you can see the quality of the. The data and all you know the different things and you know the data is accurate location all these kind of thing and it's been submitted or you know to the uh, gbif um don't poo poo your pictures because you don't think they're good enough certainly i'm not gonna get this on any of these pictures on the cover of a magazine um i probably wouldn't even use them in one of my own articles um uh, unless i was talking about iNaturalist and here we are but these three are all the same bird uh it was poor lighting i'm just I'm not a very good photographer the minute it gets cloudier it's in the dark woods but through these i put all three pictures up i cropped them so you just can see the bird uh you know in this picture you can see the spotted breast you can see there's a little bit of a, a line through the eye which you can also see in the third photo the second photo when the wings are down you can see the marking on the upper part of the wing in flight, which you don't see when the bird is walking on the right. And on the right, you can also see that um, it's a two tone bill. Um, and this is a spotted sandpiper, which I knew. Uh, give me a second, Ruth, and I'll answer that question. This is um, a spotted sandpiper, which I knew from identification. But just because I know it doesn't mean when I put it up on iNatural, somebody else is going to. But with the three pictures, I was able to get someone else to agree with my identification and get its research grade. Um, and again, I don't lose sleep at night if I don't get research grade on all my identifications. I have a lot of pictures that weren't very good. You know, sometimes it's it's like um, cooking um, pasta where you just throw the stuff against the wall to see if it'll stick. Um, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't and, and I'm okay with that. Um, Ruth asked if someone else can add your observation to a project you didn't select. Uh, Ruth, yes. Somebody can. What well, if it's a collection project? Your stuff is automatically going to go in, but to actually manually add it into another project, um, I don't think they can. I think only you can do that. But a collection project stuff automatically goes into. Uh, oh, and then you know, here's my projects: Birds of the World, Limestone Park, Alabaster, and Alabama. And I think there's actually an Alabama biodiversity project that was started since then and picked that up as well. Uh, so new, a new project. Like if somebody started a project today, it was like, I want a project for everything that was seen in Arlington, ever. 
um, that's going to go when they start that project and do the collection. It's going to collect every sighting of Arlington, not just from the point of the project being started, but all the way back. You know, if you had an old, um, you know, sepia tone photo from 1903 of um, some kind of woodchuck, you know, of a woodchuck, um, and somebody put that on iNaturalist with all the proper information, uh, and then somebody, and that was in Arlington, and then somebody started this Arlington project, it's going to go all the way back to that as well. So, um, you know, you'll find sometimes that new projects crop up on your observations because even though they came in after you made the observation, your observation falls into the collection parameters for that project. A lot of times, uh, people like, you know, see a flower. They see a plant, they see a mushroom, and they want to get an idea of what that is. And I, you know, I know a lot of people like to use iNaturalist just to discover new stuff. And it's, it's got a sister app called Seek, um, which I think is good. But sometimes I think Seek is a little too quick to identify things and, and doesn't and get some things incorrect. Um, but if you're if you're trying to identify a flower, and this can be true for anything, if you're not really sure what it is, get multiple angles. But if you're trying to identify a flower, this is common milkweed that I, I took a picture of. Um, I didn't just include a picture of the flower and what the flower looks like. I also included a picture of the whole plant, and that's going to help your identifier. Only one picture can show up at a time. Um, so I started with the flower because I like that better. Um, I think that flower picture is more inviting to identification than the entire milkweed plant, but I still got my identification. And I still you know, was able to get somebody to, to, to make sure, confirm what I thought the plant was. Um, in this case, I only did one. I often recommend this, especially for trees, because sometimes you get a picture of leaves, you get a picture of the bark, you can step back and get a picture of the whole tree and how it's shaped. Um, but in this one, I was able to, to frame the picture so I had the leaves in front of the bark with the graffiti, and it was pretty obvious this was American Beach. Um, so, you know, however you can frame the pictures, but the more information you can cram in a picture or more pictures with more information you can include uh, is going to be really helpful for uh, potential identifiers. Uh, and a mushroom. Again, this is another one. I never got it past the genus, but I started at if you can see here, my first suggestion was uh, it's a fungus, you know, which is what I knew. You know, I didn't know, but I got it all the way down to genus Amanita, which is the mushrooms you definitely don't want to eat or touch or mess with at all. Um, but in order to do that, I also took three pictures. So I've got the the top of the mushroom, the side of the mushroom, and you can see this um, structure here, which I think is is part of what's really important in identifying this into this genus and you know I got an undershot of the gills as well so you could see what they look like when they're open up um, and so you know whenever you can get uh, multiple angles fungus this is this can be really important uh, you know this can really help people that are, are trying to identify your photos um, make sure <laughs> this you can see I did this like half an hour ago I, just before I happened to spot this and I was like oh this is perfect make sure people know what you're looking for when this image just showed up ignore everything on the right for a second when this image showed up in the identify field actually if, if you guys can see my cursor right above the midline here you can kind of make out in the background there's the word identify you can just see a little little um, split piece of it that's what I click on and then all the latest observations come up and I can look through and see what needs identification and what I actually would, would know to identify this image was up in there and I was like which bird do they want because it said laughing gull next to it and I'm like I don't even know if there's a laughing gull in there so I open it up this left, lower left bird is, I'm pretty sure, the laughing gull. The middle and bottom is a turn, and the right's another turn, and the back, these all three of these are American white pelicans. You know, so if you don't mark on that picture, it could be hard for people to tell. Now, in the description here underneath the map, you can see they wrote left foreground, um, which is helpful. So I don't know how much people actually use that, but it is helpful. Um, so that tells you which bird they're looking at. But again, this is one of those things where, you know, I was telling you, I like to mark the, the picture if possible. So if I take a picture of a whole bunch of birds, I can't just submit this picture and be like, um, yeah, the American robin that's in there, because obviously one, you're not going to find a robin on the ocean waters. Um, but you really want to make sure that people know which birds you're looking for, because you can see there's a whole bunch of birds here and there's actually um, three species in here. But of all these birds, I want this tiny little one right here to the right. Oops, that little guy. And again, the resolution here is horrible, but you can see enough of the eye, shape of the head, and the two-tone of the bill that I could get agreement that this is a common uh, golden eye. 
Um, now, here's another picture of the same group that common golden eye is, I think, off to the right. But another picture, there's also three species here because in addition to these, these um, the, the, the majority of the duck are scops. Some of these big ones like on the right here that look like small, dark Canada geese. Uh, these are brants. Uh, and then in the middle, upper right of the middle pack here, you can see there's a buffalo head with that really bright white head that's uh, preening itself. Uh, and there's a couple more buff, uh, buffalo head to the upper right. Those are females. So, you know, if I put this picture up, which do I want to identify? So cropping the picture where I can more easily pick out individual birds. Uh, and then taking that crop and circling the birds I'm indicating. So these are the brants, which again, like I said, are close relatives of the Canada geese, uh, and these are the scops. And so that, so that's how I, I um, put these pictures up on iNaturalist. Um, you don't have to do that. You know, if there's a bunch in there, you don't want to mess with it. By all means, don't have to. I'm, you know, trying to make sure that I get uh, the all the observations I want, and also the people can see which ones I'm trying to to highlight here. Um, the other bit about this picture is both of these bottom pictures would be the first picture when I put them in and then I'd also include this back one here. So I'd use this back one in multiple observations to make sure that people can see size and scope and, and see the picture without the, the circles as well. Uh, are you guys hearing that sound? I don't think I shared sound. So uh, you got a big blank screen there because I was playing a frog sound. Um, and this is something I recorded um, in the old days, back when iNaturalist was young. Uh, what you had to do was record a sound, upload it to SoundCloud, and then from SoundCloud, upload it to iNaturalist, which was 37 steps and kind of a, a pain. Uh, and then they changed it recently so that you don't need to use SoundCloud. You can just upload the sound file from your computer to um, iNaturalist, which is great, but I still do the uh, memo recording, so I still have to email the sound to myself from my iPhone uh, and then upload it. So it eliminated a step or two, but still that. Well, now, as I showed you before, you can just use the iNat, iNaturalist app and click on record sound, and it does that for you in the app. And I am super excited to use that this coming weekend. Uh, like I said, I haven't tried it. I'll try to practice it once, but um, I really, really enjoy uh, the idea of being able to use that. Um, so again, you know, frogs, birds, anything that makes a noise, you can record them. If it's an identifiable sound, just like a picture can have, like that picture um, with all the, the ducks, you could call that background noise because there's, you know, dozens and dozens of other ducks. Um, if you're standing next to a busy highway trying to record a frog call or a bird call, you're probably going to get a lot of background noise and it may not help. Um, one of the things I like to do with my sounds, especially if I'm not sure how well it sounds, is you can see in the description here, I just wrote chorus of New Jersey chorus frogs. What I might write is um, the bird call is at five seconds, 10 seconds, and 15 seconds. You know, it repeats it, starts at five seconds, repeats at 10 and 15 seconds. So people know what specific call. Because a lot of times, if I make a recording and I'm not, I haven't really done any kind of sound editing. Um, you know, I may be three or four bird calls in there. I want to make sure they're identifying the right one, especially if it's one I don't know. If I've got a recording and it's got a robin uh, and it's got one of the woodpeckers that I know and another bird I know, and then there's a fourth bird I don't, I want to make sure I'm getting that fourth bird in so that I can get that identification, understand what I was hearing. Um, so again, you know, however you can help the people who are helping you identify your critter, um, know which sound or which piece of evidence you want. That's important. Um, so and again, uh, you'll have a profile page. It'll show your observations, the number of species you've seen, identifications that you uh, have made. You can follow other people to see what they contribute. Other people can follow you. Um, and again, from your profile page, you, you've got all these other options. You can look at your observations and go and edit them and search them. Um, you can look at the calendar and see how many observations you made on different days. Um, or see on what observations you made on that day. Um, lots of different ways to access your data. It's a lot of fun. Um, you know, and over here to the right there are projects and things you can look at. Um, you can fave, you know, make uh, an observation a favorite. I think that's a way of following an observation to seeing what happens with it without uh, actually making a identification. Because if you don't know, but you want to know what it is, you know, that's one way to do it. You can do journals like little blog posts as well. Uh, and you can make lists. I have lists of, um, you know, birds and bugs and in a couple of different locations that I do. So 
you know, however you want to organize lists so that you can get a list of, of things you've seen um, in either like a certain group of critters or a certain location. Um, oh, this is, as I mentioned earlier, this is the um, the Gulf Branch, uh, the Biodiversity and Gulf Branch Glebe Road Park. This is the park I work in, and so uh, I'm really excited about this one and hope people join it and contribute to it. Again, it's a collection, so it automatically goes into the bucket as soon as you've um, uh, as soon as you've made an observation. Uh, we have several of these in Arlington. Is that the next one? Yeah. Um, so this is the old image with the 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 skink. I've updated it now. It's a uh, one of our rhododendron. Um, but we have Barcroft, Bluemont, Donaldson Run, and Fort Sia Smith, uh, Gulf Branch, Long Branch, Potomac Overlook, Powden Springs, Tuckahoe, and Windy Run. Um, I think there might be a couple more, but these are the ones that 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 I've started and um, people specifically asked for. You know, so just get an idea of what is out there, and you don't have to do anything special other than you know, be in the park and take an observation and it's automatically uh, entered. Um, but it's fun to see what other people are seeing there. And it's a good way to, to check out what's happening in Arlington. So I want to make sure everybody was aware of those. Uh, so this is last year's City Nature Challenge. The reason I'm doing the iNaturalist program this week is the City Nature Challenge is this weekend, again, Friday through Monday. Um, and then there's, I think, four or five more days afterwards to, to get everything identified before the final count is made. Um, and the City Nature Challenge is a friendly um, challenge between cities around the world. It started as, I think it was LA and San Francisco. Um, and, you know, that was five or six years ago. It was six years ago, because I jumped in, my first year was the second year when they had like, uh, I think it was like 60 cities around, 60 metropolitan areas around North America. Uh, and then it's jumped to be a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. Uh, and this year, I think there's over 250 cities around the world, uh, which is really, really neat. Uh, and and the, it's a friendly competition to see who can get A, the most observations, B, the most species, and C, have the most observers out in the field participating. Um, we've done very well with the number of observers. Um, you know, species diversity, you're never going to beat a place like, you know, that's along the equator. You know, some of these other places just simply have more biodiversity uh, and we're a pretty as big as our metro area is considered we're still pretty rural and uh, metro in, in places um, so you can see this is our these are our numbers from last year we had over 28,000 observations made by over um, 1100 or uh, 1600 observers which is really neat really neat. There's a lot of people out doing this over the four-day weekend which is cool and again this is a collection project, so not all 1,655 observers knew necessarily they were doing it for the City Nature Challenge. Um, excuse me, but I guarantee it was way more than a simple majority were doing this as part of the, the City Nature Challenge. So this is our area for the Washington Sea Metro. You can see it's a very forgiving uh, metropolitan area, uh, and we're butted up against Baltimore, which is also um, uh, in the competition, but it goes right up to you know, through Maryland, there's one uh, county in West Virginia, uh, you know, several in Virginia, some more in Maryland over here. So um, really neat area. So you can go some pretty neat places and still be part of, you know, contributing to our um, our part of the, uh, the City Nature Challenge. Uh, so this is what it looks like this year. This is 2021. Um, whoop, let me skip back here real quick. Sorry. You can see this 819,000 observations around the world. Uh, I think it was 920 the year before. So it was down a little bit, but again, COVID, you know, it, it's understandable that it was a little bit, um, a little bit uh, down from the previous year. Um, we were at 28 here and I think we had 30 the previous year. So hopefully both those numbers will go back up this year. This is the uh, the City Nature Challenge 2021 project. You can join. It's got a nice number of people that have already joined it. Um, and then this is our our little neck of the woods, the City Nature Challenge in DC. Um, again, we've got about 180 people in there, which is which is great. So I hope that um, you know everybody will consider um, joining in. It, it's funny if you look at this. This is the countdown. Oh, it doesn't show the countdown. So I was looking at the countdown here or on the the uh, City Nature Challenge website. And it was like 13 hours, and I was like 13 hours. But in New Zealand, it's 13 hours. For us, it's it's roughly a day. You know, start at midnight. Um, you know, 12:01 a.m. tomorrow. That'll be. Uh, the beginning of the city nature challenge so that'll be which I say tomorrow but it'll actually be friday but that'll be pretty fun to do um but here's a map of all the participating cities you can see it's definitely very heavy north and south america uh you know but we've got 
uh, most of the continents involved there. There have been um, participants in one of the research stations at Antarctica. I don't see that on the map. I don't know if I cut it off. Um, it was hard to get the whole map into the screen grab I did, but hopefully uh, they'll do that again. I always like looking at some of the other projects to see like, you know, what's showing up in Australia or on this island out here. You know, what's showing up from Japan? What do they have in Russia, Europe, South Africa? And again, I always like checking the, uh, the Antarctica one when they actually do it. One last thing before I take some questions here. You don't have to go. Um, oh, I want to I say this now because I forgot. You can take pictures of captive or cultivated critters or plants, but you need to mark those. And there's a place to do that when you um, submit your observation. You can also, when you submit your observation, you can have it open to people the location you can have the location obscured so it's somewhere close by but it doesn't show up exactly where you took it um, if it's on private property if it's an organism that you don't want everybody to know where it is um, or you can make it private and not show any of that information that might um, inhibit people from actually being able to identify it um, but if you feel that strongly about that particular observations location you can make it private so no one will be able to see it when you contribute them to a project, if you join the project, um, you want to pay attention because sometimes it'll ask you if, you know, stuff that you submitted to the project can be, the, op, the location can be shown, so keep an eye on that as well. Um, so where should I go if I want to make observations? You don't have to go very far. As I mentioned before, this is one of my, this is, or I don't know if I mentioned it, but this is one of my favorite projects. It's never home alone. It's, it's the wildlife of homes. You know, stuff that you see in your house. Um, I. You know, live in a house that has a lot of holes in it and we get a lot of interesting critters in it. The nature center is a hundred year old um, uh, bungalow. It gets some critters in there as well. And so you see a lot of that. So sometimes you don't have to go very far. Um, you know, there's you got a white footed mouse. Uh, this pigeon is actually at Home Depot. You know, the Home Depot near where I, that I go from my house has all their bird stuff in the outside garden area. Uh, and when I was there the other day, there was a raccoon. There's a raccoon, three squirrels, six house sparrows, and a morning dove. So, you know, the, you don't have to be in the wilderness to get your observations. Um, this is a long bodied cellar spider. There's a house centipede, camel cricket, uh, garter snake. You know, these are all things that you can find in and around your home or your yard. And again, you don't have to go very far. You know, look in your yard, look at the small stuff. On the right is a dandelion. Um, you notice how I got the leaves of the dandelion to make sure I could get an accurate uh, um, identification. Next to the dandelion are two different types of dead nettle. Um, oh, I still can't remember what this blue flower is. It gets speed well in my head. And I don't know if that's correct. Uh, upper left is a buttercup. Um, the ground ivy in the bottom left, and, and this one in the middle is um, potentia, which I think is a, like a false or wild strawberry. Um, so, you know, you don't have to go very far to get these observations. And again, you know, Arlington has great parks. There's um, lots of great parks in the region like uh, Huntley Meadows and um, you know, the Nova Parks as well. So there's lots of cool places you can go and safely do it. And, and always make sure you take care of your safety, pay attention to where you're at, what you're doing, take some water, sunscreen, bug spray, all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I just and I like this quote from Einstein. You know, it's always there's always something new to learn. Nature is full of surprises and, and nobody out there knows it all. You know, so get out there and find some cool stuff and surprise yourself, surprise some of us. You know, there's always something neat that comes out of one of these, um, uh, these city nature challenges. I think one of the first years they found this massive puffball fungus over in uh, either Donaldson Run or Potomac Overlook. So all kinds of neat stuff that can be found. It's just out there waiting for us to, to notice it. Um, so thank you. I end with, uh, this is a striped mud turtle which I took a photo of down at uh, Akakwan Bay National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and it's one of the northernmost points that these are spotted. Um, and whoever helped me identify this got really excited because they hadn't didn't know that they were that far north. And it was like, I was taking a picture of a mud turtle. So that was pretty exciting. But you can see the line behind the eye that goes through and it actually goes through the eye. And when you looked at it up close, um, they made an identification. That was pretty neat. So I was pretty excited to have contributed something like that. So that's my slideshow. Let me stop sharing my screen for a second. See if anybody has any questions. 
Okay. Uh, does, does anybody have any questions? Oh, it's a few more people than when I started. That's nice. Uh, go ahead. You feel free to unmute. And you can let me know what your question is. Hi, this Hi. is Paul. I'm the park steward at Brandon Park Hospital. Okay. Are you feedback? Uh, I'm not. Oh, okay. I'll oh, try. Sorry. To, sure. Try to come deal with it. Um, could you please create a project for Brandy Moore Castle, which is part of Madison Manor Park? Yes, I can. Let's do that offline. Um, okay. uh, yeah, I, I get story time after I'm done here with my daughter. So, um, but maybe we can set up a time to talk uh, one of the next two days, and I can help you do that. No problem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Is it obvious? Um, it can't. It? It can be when, when you're if you're setting up something like that for a um, a, a location, you want to make sure you have an accurate uh, location uh, parameters. And I think that might already be in iNaturalist because um, one of the the master naturalists did a really nice job of taking all the um, GPS coordinates for all our open space and putting them in as as places. Mm -hmm. um, so ideally, we could do that really easy. OK, uh, occasionally when I'm taking photos on the western side, uh, Yes, the western side uh, of Brandymore Castle. It puts me in the Benjamin Banneker Dog Park, um, and which is like a block and a half away. That's Our, yeah, yeah, and that's sometimes that's just your. Uh, I'm assuming that's using a phone. Yeah. Yeah, that's because you're getting bad reception there, and so it widens your your oh. error error bar. Yeah, and sometimes that will affect whether it gets in the project or not. Because if enough of your error bar isn't in the project that mm -hmm. could affect it. So if you keep having that issue, what you may want to do is take your pictures um, and then enter the location manually so mm -hmm. that you're getting it smaller so you can get it where you want. So it is included in the project. Ah, OK, so, thanks. That's yeah. Great. Oh, no worries. No worries. Uh, anyone else have questions? I think somebody asked me about um, adding multiple pictures. Yes, that was me, Ken. It's Elizabeth. I have done this. Um, if you could actually just kind of walk through, like, because I also couldn't see the submit button, and sometimes I'm wondering, did I actually submit that? Okay. Um, here, let's do this real quick. I'm going to share my screen yeah. again. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, and I'm going to walk through, but um, not actually submit this one because I just did these last night, but I know I've got the pictures here. Um, so let's go through. Um, so you would choose upload, which is always in the upper right here. Oops, boy, it's a really touchy keyboard. Um, and then go to choose files. And you, you could drag and drop. I always do choose files because I have my stuff stored somewhere. Let's see, pictures. No, maybe not. Maybe I'm lying to you. Where did I do? Oh, you know what? I had them on the disk. I don't have it here. Oh, wait, we're going to do something. We're going to do the same thing, but I'm just going to kind of. Oops. Let's see if I can find. Bear with me for a second, folks. Sorry, I thought I had something and I don't. Um, is this that is pictures? Do, 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 do. We're going to have to do. Oh, here we go. We're going to do these pictures here. Okay. All right. So if I wanted to combine photos, see how um, I, I selected two photos and now you've got two photos here. If I had selected 15, it would be all out here. It'd be in rows of six. So you'd have to scroll down through them all. Okay. Um, Wow, it's already, that's interesting. It's already selected that these are cicadas. Um, and you can see the metadata is already in here for the date and time. There's no location because again, the, the the camera I use doesn't have that. Um, so if I click on this one, I can edit it here or over here on the left in this bar. If I click select all, I can look edit both observations by using this on the left. What I'm actually going to do is because these are roughly the same picture and image. Uh, this is just a closer version of this one. If I wanted to add these as both pictures to an observation, I'm going to grab this and just move it on top. And that's it. Now when I have an ops when I submit this as an observation, it will be 
two images. Because now if you click on the image, you see I can scroll through the two images that are part of this observation. And then, um, and now here's the other thing. It automatically put in cicadas. I know that this is actually, let's see, uh, it's not dog day, it's not typical. Um, I know that this is actually, why are we not? Whoops. Magic cicada. So I could change that. So now I'm at periodical cicadas. And then for my location, I'm going to the world. Um, and you can scroll. It just takes forever. But I, I got to admit, sometimes I, I simply enjoy it because it's fun. Whoops, no, that is not my sighting at all. Actually, you know what? Or you can do this. I should just do this. Spotsylvania. Battlefield. And I don't know where in the park this would be, but let's say I did. Let's say I actually spotted these here. The smaller you make your circle, the less error it has. Uh, the more accurate it is, the better it's going to land in um, some projects. And let's say, let's say I actually saw them on this bush right here. So update observations. Now I've got my location, got my date and time, I've got my name, and if I wanted to, I would submit, which I'm not going to because I already have these in somewhere else. OK, um, yeah, dragging and dropping. Um, yep. Sometimes this stuff just isn't intuitive. That was very helpful. Thank you. Oh, yeah, no, no, no problem at all. And again, <laughs> you, I learned it all by doing that. You could also yeah. let's um, now I got to remember how to, how do I cancel out of this? <laughs> uh, oh, you know, I'm just going to do back. Leave page. I don't want to say that. OK, the other thing you can do is you can go in if you've already got your observation up. Like let's say you put one photo up and you realize, hey, I got better photos than this or additional sides. You can go to your observation. Um, like let's see, like this, uh, like let's say I, I found that I have a here's a picture of. You know, ruby throated hummingbird that's sitting in the pine tree next to the nature center. I found that I have another picture that's even more helpful in identification. I've already submitted this as an observation. I can go to edit. And now this is um, when I started doing iNaturalist, this is what it looked like, and, and I'm glad it doesn't do this anymore. Um, but you can go in and I can go over here where it says add photos. And I can. Oh, oh browse. And I can add another photo in. So if I wanted to add, if this was a photo of my hummingbird, I could add that photo in as well. It'll take a second to load up, but eventually it will show. And then you can also, if it's if it's not already, um, the information on your observation is not already synced with the metadata on the photo, you can check this box to make sure it is. OK, wait a second. Can you just go through this a little bit more slowly? Because this is my precise problem. So then the photo will come up and then what do you have to do with it? Should. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh so here it is right here. OK, next to, do you see my cursor? Yes. OK, so right next to browse. That is the image I loaded. Now mm -hmm. what I would do is. Save the observation. I'm going to have to go back and delete the photo, but that's OK. Give me a second here and now. Come on, computer, you can do it. So there's my ruby throated hummingbird. And you can see I added a second photo. So now when I click on here, I go to the right. There's the second photo I click, which does not at all look like a hummingbird. OK, um, but that's how you could do. You can do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, thank you. No worries. And then I want to actually take that photo back out. And I can just uncheck it. And save the observation. <coughs> Excuse me. Like for instance, let's say you put up four photos and realize one of them is not a hummingbird at all, like I just did. Now my uh, my photo is gone and I'm just back down to the original photo again. Any or any other questions I can help with? Uh, 
Uh, Joe Allen, I will say just email me after the program is over. Just email me and we'll uh, and I'll respond to you. We'll set up the time to set up that project. Um, so several of the people out there, anybody else have any questions on a naturalist? Uh, and again, if not, as I mentioned, I'm around all day Friday. I'm around all day Saturday at the Nature Center because we're open now Thursday through Saturday, 10 to 5. So if you want to pop in, um, you again, you can email ahead and make sure I'm going to be around and available or not in the middle of something. But um, you can pop in and, you know, I can answer any questions or we could go out into the, the grounds and do a couple of um, um, observations and make sure that you're comfortable with it. Thanks, Elizabeth. Okay, whoops. That's not what I wanted at all. There we go. All right. Anyone else? Well, then I'm going to say thank you all for joining me. Hope you have a wonderful day. Hope you all join a naturalist and uh, get on there, do some observ observing, and get out for the uh, City Nature Challenge this weekend. Thank you. Have a good evening, everybody. Thanks.